podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to the Pre-Hospital Care Research Forum Educational Research Journal Club podcast. The Pre-Hospital Care Research Forum is dedicated to the promotion, education, and dissemination of pre-hospital research. We believe that it is the responsibility of emergency medical professionals worldwide to build a body of evidence to examine pre-hospital emergency care. As you may know, the PCRF has partnered with the National Association of EMS Educators to promote research literacy and advance the science of EMS educational research. Now, as part of this alliance, these podcasts are held on the fourth Friday of every month. Here with the PCRF Journal Club, we take a closer look at some of the latest research happening in medical education. I'm Megan Corey here with David Page and Bill Toon. We also have Sahaj Khalsa joining us from India. Chair of the Sahaj is the chair of the National Association of EMS Educators Cultural Competency Task Force. Also joining us on our panel, we have Jamie Kennel, Mike Tegman, and Dr. Michelle Sweeney. We want to welcome the primary author of the research paper who will be presenting her research today, and that's Dr. Cynthia Ferranda, Associate Professor of the University of Miami School of Nursing and Health Studies, and also President-Elect of the International Association for Clinical Simulation and Learning in Nursing. The study we'll be reviewing today is entitled Cultural Competency and Cultural Humility in Simulation-Based Education, an Integrative Review a study published in the journal Clinical Simulation and Nursing. This review is paired with an article in EMS World called Research Alert, a review of the original medical education research. And we encourage listeners to check out this article at emsworld.com under the category of education and training. Now, thank you all for joining us today. So we're going to begin, and we want to remind listeners that you can use the chat feature on your screen to type in questions and comments, and we'll bring those into the conversation as we go. We want to give a little special shout out to the National Association of EMS Educators Level 2 EMS Instructor course going on right now at UCLA, so we'd like to hear from you all down there. Um, I'm in San Francisco, so I can say that down there at UCLA. So welcome. A little bit of background, um, healthcare disparities, we know that they're well documented in the medical literature and in particular in EMS, uh, because this is an EMS uh, journal club. And on this podcast, I'm, I think Dave, you can remind me, but it's about two years ago, we were talking about um, an article on disparities in recognizing stroke in the field uh, by race and gender. And more recently, I know the PCRF, we've had abstract submissions uh, on pain management um, that and disparities in, in the provisions of pain management in the field, on student outcomes. In fact, uh, Kim McKenna's research just a few weeks ago that was presented at the NAMC conference uh, discussed the National Registry of uh, EMT is that test takers uh, for the basic level exam and persistence in taking that exam uh, after failing a first attempt, showing the disparities in those groups by um, race and age, uh, older students and Latinos uh, being underrepresented in groups that were uh, persisting to take uh, the EMT basic level exam after failing at a first attempt. So we've discussed on this podcast also the need for interprofessional training in simulation and the development of student learning outcomes uh, that reflect diversity of students and, and patients and healthcare personnel and emergency responders. So one of the directions we've talked about, too, is to integrate cultural humility into simulation. So, Dave, uh, did you remember, recall other, other things that I'm missing or that I'm forgetting? Uh, There's such about... a, a rich uh, history here of um, that, uh, that intent to, to address cultural uh, disparities. And I think this, this is going to be a fantastic podcast to highlight mm -hmm. that. If you think back to Nancy Caroline and Peter yes. Saffer working in, in the Hill District in Pittsburgh uh, to train some of the first paramedics, we, we know that there's uh, a, a deep uh, and, and very uh, important historical significance to what we see as inclusiveness and um, just learning about other cultures. And I'm really excited about this. We have people that are tuned in from all over the world, literally. We have some folks from Canada, Australia, the Philippines, Ecuador, Mexico, in, and obviously India as well uh, with the hedge there. So um, I, I really uh, wanna turn it over to Dr. Ferranda so, so we hear about her amazing work. 
Okay. Well, thank you all for tuning in and showing interest in what I think is a very important topic, and obviously you do as well, that is cultural competence and cultural humility and simulation. So just to give you a little introduction, I'll share with you my bias as it may come through. Uh, I am a Caucasian American and I am a nurse. So this might shine through a little bit, although the work I intend to present is both international as well as interdisciplinary. Um, so I am coming from the University of Miami. We're proud in the US that it is, we have uh, the first simulation hospital and healthcare system uh, in our school of nursing. It is a, let's see, five story, 41,000 square foot facility that has a full scale emergency department with ambulance bays, ICUs, med surge, NICU, PICU, and even apartments so we can simulate home care. So this was just constructed in 2017 and as it rolls out, we're really excited to see what we can do in terms of interdisciplinary work. Um, today, I would like to explore the meaning of cultural competence and cultural humility with you. We'll analyze the state of the science of cultural humility from an interdisciplinary perspective. We'll discuss recommendations for teaching and improving cultural humility with students and appreciate the importance of policy reform to drive educational practices. To give you a little bit of background, leading authorities in education, such as the Institute of Medicine, NLN, and others, have emphasized the importance of diversifying our workforce. Um, see, this is where the US-centric perspective comes in, but I'll try to broaden it out. Uh, in the U.S., we definitely have disparities in terms of minority representation in our health sciences fields. We are advocated and recommended that we in include new educational models to promote respect for race, ethnicity, and more. We are supposed to emphasize diversity and inclusion efforts in our educational settings and work for increased retention of racial and ethnic minorities. We know that, that um, students of minority status often uh, will leave or they will either fail out or they will force, face some sort of attrition um, at a disparate amount compared to other populations. So we really wanna focus on creating more inclusive environments. So coming to you from the simulation world, uh, probably the most robust study that I've ever seen is the National Council State Boards of Nursing Simulation Study. This was a multi-site study that basically provides the first evidence that we are allowed to substitute as much as 50% of our clinical practicum time uh, with, with uh, clinical. So um, we, we had the question, is it okay to use simulation in lieu of clinical time? And this study demonstrated that, yes, uh, we can substitute as much as 50% and have equivalent outcomes. So this is the best study to date. Yet interestingly, um, the students who identified as a minority demonstrated the highest attrition rate. They dropped out of the study. So we don't have particular reason as to why, but we, it does make us ask questions. Why did they not feel comfortable in the study? Why did they drop out? Um, and so this, this leads us with some unanswered questions. We do have quite a bit of evidence to show that current simulation practices pose challenges for minority students. We have work that has indicated, this is qualitative work now, that has indicated that students of a racial minority, they feel extra pressure to perform. They feel like they have to represent their race. They feel underrepresented and so again, this is, this is in the US. When minority and faculty mannequins were presented that demonstrated some diversity, the minority students said they finally felt included. There's one poignant quote from the study here, the Fusilier, Baldwin, and Townsend Chambers. And the student said, when I saw the mannequin of color, I wanted to cry. I actually felt represented. Um, Here's a results from a small study we conducted 
examining the presence of racial diversity in simulation advertisements. We went to an international conference and looked at the vendor displays, and we found that 94% of the part, body parts were white and only 6% were black. Now, right now we're doing white and black. It's a dichotomy. That's currently how the term race is identified, but I'm clearly min minimizing the full scope of the human existence. And then we'll introduce you to one more study in the background before we, we move forward. So uh, we currently completed an international study examining the amount of the presence of diversity in simulation centers globally. So we went ahead and we surveyed individuals from um, the Society for Simulation and Healthcare, from the International Nursing Association, um, the Inaxel organization, and others. Um, and this is what we found out. We had a pretty good sample of uh, 161 simulation educators reporting. And what they ended up reporting is that there were significant challenges of purchasing diverse mannequins. Now this could be a, man a manufacturing issue. Uh, they also described there was a lack of realism in the um, mannequins of color that, that were manufactured. Uh, there were quotes such as dipping the mannequins in chocolate. In other words, they had the mannequins had European features, but they were just painted over, which actually was offensive to some individuals who identified with that race. So there was lack of availability, lack of realism, and there were some problems that emerged. Um, from this study, we also found that individuals thought it was important to have diversity in sim. However, they felt the diversity should only represent the regional population. So if you're in a rural setting and, and there's not very much diversity, that, then you should just represent that region. And personally, I take a more global approach and I would say we want to educate individuals to be globally competent practitioners. But that was, you know, those are the results that surfaced. And then a theme emerged about the presence of diversity. They indicated there's a lack of diversity. Some institutions were making efforts to improve and others were already incorporating diversity. Um, we're wrapping up with this study here. Um, an important revelation that came out was this notion of being colorblind. Um, we saw poignant quotes such as, we are all there to learn. It doesn't matter what color the mannequin is. Or it's more important to focus on the individual's worth and value of a person, not on the color of someone's skin. Love is colorblind. Um, another poignant quote, maybe we should make them all green. Then people wouldn't care. So when we go back to Cross's work, um, he presents um, a spectrum, if you will, of leading to truly cultural proficient care. Uh, you'll see uh, on, the, on the bottom of the scale, it, it's very negative, and you start with the phases of cultural destructiveness, and you kind of move upwards to cultural incapacity. In the middle of the trajectory, you'll see cultural blindness, and that whole notion of why, why don't we just make them all green? Who cares? Um, that actually demonstrates a little bit of room for improvement in terms of moving towards cultural proficiency. And that is really the objective according to Cross's work. Okay, so before we move on, um, I just wanted to pause and see if anyone else had experiences or questions about some of the background information just stated regarding uh, cultural humility and simulation or diversity and simulation. Okay, I think David, you had. Um, I think some will be struck first by uh, if you if they didn't know by the fact that um, there was the study in nursing. Uh, I was aware of it. I'm not sure if others were aware of the the study. About 50% of the patients can be simulated, replacing uh, the clinical experience. And I, I remember that being a, a seminal study and one that uh, affects all you know nursing education programs. It didn't really even dawn on me that. Of course, there's going to be an element that's affected in in terms of uh, cultural diversity. 
because of what you're talking about, exactly what you're talking about, which is the the mannequins, the, the things that are, are made in the classroom, the, um, the diverse or lack of diverse makeup of uh, faculty in healthcare or in some healthcare programs. Uh, so I'm wondering, Dave, did you have anything uh, to add on that? I believe you had a question. Oh, there's, it's, a, it's such rich conversation here. Uh -huh. And I'm really happy that you've done this work. I think um, Kim McKenna and others uh, did a wonderful, by uh, Elliot Carhart, a, a wonderful study about how our own simulation in EMS has been, yeah. you know, our mannequins are, quote, in the closet, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And and when you do pull them out and you look at them, you think, yeah, they're all, you know, they're, they're, the skin is all um, pink. And I, I think it's interesting how people um, tend to want to see the, quote, melting pot, and they want race and ethnicity not to matter or cultural context not to matter. But I think that um, that's clearly the wrong approach. It, it's mm -hmm. sort of like saying everybody should just buy the same size shoe and then well, if it doesn't fit you, then I guess, you know, you should wear the you know shoes that don't fit you. Because I do think there's there's um, cultural context, uh, you know, when a paramedic is evaluating a, a patient that's um, whether uh, from a Middle Eastern or or uh, a religious background that says, I uh, don't really discuss my health care with you without the presence of a family member or a particular type of family member. And um, and when a, a Hispanic, uh, I'm from Mexico, so my my upbringing when someone's uh, sick and uh, um, you know injured is is to be upset. Um, that if you're not upset, then you wouldn't be showing an appropriate cultural response. The the Germanic um, approach that I've learned in Minnesota about wow, um, you know, you're kind of acting this out is really not not culturally appropriate. So I really liked um, what you said in terms of the, uh, especially in the paper here, you, in the in the background section, you talk about that definition of a process of openness, self-awareness, being egoless, incorporating self-reflection and critique yes. and be willing to interact with diverse individuals. Well, I and think I just, also, uh, yeah. David, you're talking about, we're talking a lot about race and color um, and and culture is deep and it, it um, and all encompassing. And I think that's why cultural humility is so powerful because it's really about the ability to see things from multiple perspectives. So um, we have transgender populations. We have, um, you know, different type, cultures of different professions that we deal with in, in the interprofessional learning environment. So I think it's so much deeper than just mannequin colors too. Yeah. Um, Mike Tegman has some experience with some of this. Uh, did you have a, a question? You know, I, I did, David, and the, uh, I guess the, uh, the, the question, Dr. Fadina, is, uh, um, and it's not specifically, I guess it does kind of relate to simulation, um, but it has to do with uh, the Project Implicit at Harvard and the Implicit uh, Association Test, um, which in my mind is, is kind of a, uh, a simulation strategy for helping people identify um, their own implicit bias and, and work with them. And I just I wondered if you had thoughts uh, about if you have experience with that and if you have thoughts about how it might be um, related to uh, your work in the in the full simulation setting. So I do plan on talking about some recommendations later in the presentation. Yeah. I was, um, you know, what I, I have a, a brand new tool that I've developed to do exactly that, which is assess one's own cultural humility with the intent of being able to measure it before and after specific simulations to see if indeed it worked. Um, that's awesome. I, wow, that's awesome. Yeah, so that work is coming. It's actually being tested as we speak. Um, I, we would else? love to test that with paramedic students as well. Yeah. I think having a, a, the ability to have a, a tool, a validated instrument that could measure beginning and, and ending or, or before and after uh, kind of an intervention is, is, I think, strong. Right. And you raised another really good point, and I'm glad you raised it. Um, the beginning of this talk really focused on just uh, racial diversity. Um, what I did is I compiled a lot of my studies and work um, rather than focus on the singular article. 
Um, but I will focus very soon as we move forward. So thank you for bringing that up because it is completely true that when we talk about cultural humility, we're talking about uh, it in the broadest sense from interprofessional diversity to ethnic diversity to, to even um, weight, diversity as uh -huh. in population in terms of being obese or thin. or So diversity is it, just such a, a broad term. And, and I'm glad you raised that because I, I've done a lot of work that focuses on race and I brought that forward, but that's certainly not um, the, the the limitation of this application. Great. Awesome. Keep going, keep oh, going. Let's okay. Keep going. Yeah, this I'm is great. On. So what the <laughs> heck is cultural humility? And you are leading into it very nicely for me. Um, so basically, uh, myself and some colleagues back in 2016 conducted a concept analysis to try to figure out exactly what it means based on the literature and society's interpretation. And we came up with the following model uh, as well as definition. Um, so in a multicultural world where power imbalances exist, cultural humility is a process of being open, self-aware, egoless, and incorporating self-reflection and critique after willingly interacting with diverse individuals. The results of achieving cultural humility are mutual empowerment, respect, partnerships, optimal care, and lifelong learning. So that is the definition that we developed. I want to reiterate that cultural humility is really a lifelong learning process. Different than cultural competence, which um, kind of implies that one can master a culture. Um, that we, we know that it takes years of immersion to really master any particular culture. Cultural humility is different because it recognizes that we're just going to keep learning as we go. We're going to um, self-reflect on our interactions and, and think how could we have improved that? What did we do right? What, what did we not do right that we'll never do again? Uh, but you have to be open for that to happen. So now I'm going to move on to the specific article which we are to speak about. And this was an integrative review. So different than a systematic review, uh, which is a bit more rigorous, an integrative review. Um, it, it, well, we did use a systematic approach for it, and we did focus in on studies, and we also did an appraisal. We just didn't go back for decades and decades and do hand searches of the references. So this is a pretty robust integrative review. Um, That's a, it's a good point to bring in here, too, because, uh, you know, on our other podcast, we have Tony Fernandez, who's an um, epidemiologist. He comes in and describes this so that people who are doing research or want to do research understand what this is. And uh, um, I just want to kind of interject, as you said, mm -hmm. not as rigorous, but I think that's because we have this um, – this commitment to randomized controlled trials, which is the systematic review tends to focus heavily on randomized controlled trials. So uh, the integrative review can in include other things like qualitative research and policies and, and things like that. So, you know, I, I, other people, qualitative researchers out there probably say, wait a minute, rigorous, not, not necessarily more rigorous, just uh, it's different. It, it encompasses a different uh, group of studies. Good point, and that, that can be a strength, depending on how you yes, look at it. Yes, so, I, I would agree. Good. So in the article, our goal was to provide the state of the science on the presence of cultural humility in simulation education. And hopefully this would provide direction for us in terms of education, research, and policy. So with the paper, we went ahead and used Whittemore and Napple's method for integrative review. And then in terms of article appraisal, we ranked them on a scale of one to seven, one being the highest quality of evidence and seven being the lowest, using Melnick and Overholt's levels of evidence. We went ahead and searched four different databases to try to, to, try to capture more of an interprofessional audience, um, or I should say literature base. We had assistance of a library scientist we used um, various search terms, including cultural competence and humility, uh, as well as simulation. And we ended up with 16 relevant studies. For those of you who have visual capability, we have the Prisma flowchart here. So we did very systematically incorporate a search with a team of there were five or six of, six of us on this one. It was a robust team. And now for the fun part, the results. So. The literature represented the following dip disciplines, uh, learners from medicine, nursing, 
pharmacy, global health, child welfare, as well as nurses and physicians as learners. The simulations simulated populations including Latino families, Arab American Muslim patients, diverse older adults, geriatric patients, individuals who live in rural areas, native English speakers, individuals and communities who live in poverty, colorectal cancer screening patients, and obstetric patients. So it's very diverse and wide in terms of the different ways we were simulating uh, diversity. So when we synthesized all the literature, four themes of learning outcomes really emerged. So what we know is that simulation did lead to improved cultural sensitivity and competence, uh, improved communication. Students left feeling improved comfort as well as confidence in their cares. And they left with uh, insight as well as understanding. So we'll go through each of those briefly. Some of the words to describe the cultural sensitivity and competence they acquired was that they learned cultural empathy, they learned to appreciate diversity, they learned social justice and cross-cultural mm -hmm. skills. Um, in terms of describing communication, they learned improved interprofessional communication as well as interdisciplinary awareness through these types of simulations. They expressed having confidence in their decision making, more comfort in their cross-cultural skills, having a positive impact on perceived cultural view and comfort in fieldwork settings, so that they better understand obstacles faced. And last, for the insight and understanding, um, they had a new insight. They had awareness, understanding, appreciation, a perception change and use terms such as, it opened my eyes to describe the learning afterward. So of all those studies, the majority were low level, meaning not, not very high quality evidence. Um, however, we're just beginning to uh, develop better research in this area. And interestingly, not one study mentioned the notion of cultural humility. So this is, again, the ter term we're supposed to move toward. That is a more humble term. That is uh, understanding we cannot achieve mastery, but it is a way of thinking. And not one study mentioned this. So some of the gaps that, that resulted, um, we realized we don't have enough simulations that address ethnic diversity, religious diversity. There was. Uh, a gap in terms of LGBTQ community simulations. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, having individuals who are morbidly obese or disabled, there's a lack in interprofessional diversity. As you know, we're moving away from the silos and we're trying to have um, multiple prof professions of students interact earlier in their education so that when they reach the real world, they will um, be more equipped to understand the different languages and the different ways that different professions are prepared so they can function better, uh, as well as racial diversity. So these were some gaps that became apparent when we look at the evidence base in cultural humility and simulation. I think it's so important, um, if you can uh, stay on that slide. Could you sure, go sure. back to that one just a Absolutely. second mm -hmm. uh, to soak that in a little bit? Um, the interprofessional diversity, I think people don't think about that. Again, when you use the term diversity, most people migrate um, to race, um, and for good reason, uh, because it is such an, an issue, especially in America, uh, that's in the popular media, but it's also in, in a lot of our research literature. But the interprofessional diversity, uh, the, again, the ability to see things from multiple perspectives, just as a note, and I know, Dave, you and I talked about this once, uh, just as an aside at a conference, but I was just talking to my class about this. Um, I teach paramedic students, and we were just talking about how it's uh, interesting just calling out a certain behavior um, when you ask students to create a scenario, uh, when you ask them to write a scenario, you you can lift out some of this from their writing. And when they perform the scenario or set it up 
to to perform this scenario for uh, another group that's going to be then responders. And if, here's an example: you ask them to to give a skilled nursing facility scenario, and classically, what we've seen happen uh, on many occasions is they have a bystander who is a, a um, CNA who has a foreign accent and says the same thing. You know, this isn't my patient. I've I've just come off of lunch. I'm not. Yeah. You know. It's and, and that's the, biased. Yeah, 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 absolutely. For so many reasons. And then I said, have you have you thought about one thing here? Um, you know, why is it that everyone is saying, you know, I, I, it's not my patient. I've I just come off duty or whatever. I said, did it ever strike you that most of the? And this is actually in the research literature that most of the time that uh, when you during transitions of care are, are vulnerable times for patients. So that is more likely to be a time when you notice a patient going south or when they do go south is during those transitions, either at handover shifts or during a transfer of a patient. Certainly uh, EMTs and paramedics will agree with this. When you transfer a patient from gurney to hospital bed, from ambulance to hospital, those are vulnerable times for a person when you're more likely to see them kind of go south. So if we don't understand the frame of rest, preference that That's the other right. person is coming from, then we have tremendous communication and, and gaps in care and, 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 and problems with just stereotypes. I think that the NEMT GEMS course is a good example of when people in simulation are pretending to be geriatric patients and, and have vision and impair, we impair their vision, we impair their ability to walk and to move their, their fingers to be able to hear. And mm -hmm. when you immerse them into an, an, a simulation experience of what it feels like to be older or what it would feel like to be a person of a different culture who's trying to communicate about healthcare needs of this particular patient. But even just as a, as a receiving RN in an emergency department, if it's the paramedic student who actually has to put themselves in the position of receiving the information and thinking, wow, you didn't even call us, you showed up unannounced, I don't exactly know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, just the immersion of can you, can you be uh, a dispatcher and, and realize, gosh, um, if, the, if the dispatcher is sitting in an office and doesn't know what's going on, how do you expect them to answer your radio call in that manner? I, I, we, we, um, I, I've uh, for many, many years uh, um, advocated for this experiential learning, and I, I, think, I think Mike Tegman and, and others have, have created these courses where we fully immerse them into an ambulance simulation with ambulances in an academy style kind of event. And, and uh, in our case, using actors from uh, one of the, the local universities, Hamlin University's improv program had their actors actually research the role of what a, what a, um, a, a couple would do if they were two men who uh, were, one of which is, is dying of uh, AIDS, is HIV positive. And um, by having the two men kiss during the simulation, which was really difficult for the actors, but also for the, uh, for the students in the simulation, there was a tremendous uh, impact of, wow, there, there's, there's a, a man kissing a man, number one, but they're HIV positive, and how do I feel about uh, and, and do I really understand transmission of that disease enough to mm -hmm. react to it? And, and they don't want to be, one of them doesn't want to be transported. And there's an angle to it that's a, that's a, a piece of domestic um, disturbance that feels almost like, oh, is there, is, there, is there safety issues? But do I, how do I feel about all this? And I have to say, um, in this process, whether it's a patient with, um, you know, who's a geriatric patient or someone who's got, um, other uh, conditions or comorbidities or even just beliefs about their diseases that that putting them in an immersion experience you know I, I, I again I don't have the research to prove it so I'm I'm super curious about what uh, you're saying is is um, uh, has been a, a, a review of very low level evidence and in this podcast we do really want to talk about what that means low, low level versus high level but I, I don't need a randomized control double blind trial to figure okay. out that my students jaws were on the floor <laughs> and that they they couldn't stop talking about the two men who kissed uh, it, yeah. you know it's a it's a whoa uh, moment so Jamie yeah, Kennel, might, Jamie I, Kennel. I, I, yeah I think he has a, a question too 
You bet. Thank you. And Dr. Fronda, thanks for taking the time. Uh, it's a fascinating subject uh, and a, a very important one. Uh, a couple questions come to mind for me about the research in general, and I'm wondering if you can speak to them a little bit. Uh, the first is, do you have a sense of how how confident we can be in generalizing uh, the work that looks at people that do sim and go through the work to get it into published literature versus all of the sim operations that are out there by faculty that are likely not doing it in such a way or choose not to put it into published journals and so it would never come into view for for an effort like this well you raised some some good points uh, it is possible that more efforts are going on or occurring um, that that are not documented and i guess i'm hopeful that that is the case um, when, we, when we think about the, the sim, simulation literature as I synthesized it in this review article, um, the, the studies were, were pretty low level, meaning they were descriptive studies, qualitative studies. We don't, no one's really taken this up as a science, it seems, or relatively few individuals have taken this up as a science or something worth doing a, a lengthy multi-site study about. Uh, so it's just emerging, and that, that's exciting and offers us opportunity. Um, but you raise a good point that if faculty are not trained in the best practices of simulation, they're not following international simulation standards, then we really can't be too confident in terms of the outcomes that we would expect to result. So it's really important. I, I was very fortunate to work at Johns Hopkins with Dr. Pam Jeffries, who uh, really developed the framework we use for simulation and so we were taught you know how to construct or conduct simulation at its best um, but there is a, a lot of uh, turmoil about taking the policy change forward in other words allowing institutions to substitute 50 percent of time for clinical because we're not sure how those institutions are running simulation at all and that study only applies to those who were trained using the best ways, using international standards and a tried and true framework. You bet, you bet. And I guess there would, there's probably an unknown number of schools out there that are doing it according to international standards, but are just so swamped with their teaching load or their sim load that they're choosing not to write it up for journal publication. And so it wouldn't be available to be uh, included in lit reviews like this. Is that accurate as well? Absolutely. Okay. I, I'm going to interject a little bit here too. One of the things we talk about at the um, at NAMC conferences is the development of an action research network of uh, VMS educators uh, to you know to decide to run even small, tight, tightly um, designed studies and and get together and put and throw in an abstract um, and you know publish results that are related I think it's it you see action research networks happening among elementary school educators and and high school secondary school educators and um, I think that it's entirely possible and I think especially through an organization like the NAMC and and at conferences like that we, we've discussed it now for a couple of years just in in breakout sessions so I think this would be a great opportunity to do something like that um, the other thing I want to point out is that, uh, and as Jamie pointed out, it, when we get into, because this is a research podcast, just to dig into how the integrative review was performed, uh, one of the limitations that was stated in the paper, and I think Dr. Fronda can speak to it, is that these were case studies, abstracts, vignettes, articles that were not written in English. Those were excluded. Um, so we have, you know, it's interesting. This is a study, you know, about uh, um about diversity and simulation, about cultural humility, but we didn't really look at the uh, the, the other non-English um, abstracts and research. Great points, and that's a great segue to the next slide <laughs> <laughs> of limitations, and that is the American Basins that the research team held. Um, we did have um, quite a bit of cultural diversity and ethnic diversity um, on our team, which I think is a strength. But yes, um, we only conducted reviews of, liter of, of articles that were offered in English. Although I didn't see many in Spanish. Um, there may have been a few abstracts, but we excluded abstracts. We just wanted um, articles. But you're right, there are just po 
possibly so many other variables that, that we might have missed uh, given, given the manner that we found the articles. Um, other limitations were that of the studies that we reviewed, many lacked reliable and valid instruments. Many times the instruments were just developed by uh, the faculty member, uh, not really piloted, tested. Um, and so that's an area we need to grow in terms of simulation research. And uh, it's also a strength. <laughs> the review captured a wide range of disciplines, but it's really hard to synthesize when you have such breadth. And it was really hard to do it. <laughs> so that was um, a limitation. You know, if I might digress a little bit um, during the conversation you, you had just a minute ago, you, you spurred some thoughts um, from my previous experience regarding, and I'll go back, the interprofessional diversity. And I know a lot of schools are really trying to push forward the interprofessional education movement. Uh, when I was at Hopkins, I was fortunate to be a core member of their IPE, or Interprofessional Education Initiative. Um, so one of the things we did is we um, brought together pharmacy students, medicine students, and nursing students. And we, we taught, we talked with each other, we tried to get comfortable with each other. Um, and what stood out is how the other disciplines, again, I'm very nursing centric, the other disciplines had no idea about all the different nursing programs that we offer. We have one year programs, two year, four year. Um, we have doctoral nursing programs. And so uh, that was very enlightening to share the length of education we, we have. Um, and it was just really nice to introduce the different disciplines to each other early so that they, they realize their similarities. Uh, another initiative we did, which was geared to improve communication that sometimes is impeded due to different disciplines, is we actually did a research study on using a team-to-team -team handover uh, report guide. In other words, in, in st this was a, a project that we did in the pediatric ICU we noticed some problems transferring patients from the PEDS emergency department to the PICU. Um, and so what we did is we came up with uh, a one-page piece of paper that had all the disciplines reporting to each other in team form. Uh, and that was demonstrated to be effective in terms of reducing length of stay and improving other patient outcomes. Um, but it just it goes to show you when you have a physician and physician giving each other report or handover through the phone, and then you have nurses giving handover to each other, and respiratory therapists and paramedics, and everyone's reporting to different people. Um, so many things get missed. A, a common thing that was missed is uh, the physicians assumed the meds were all in the patient when it, it actually came out that the, the nurses were getting ready to give it. But when they did the team to team reports, they could say, we're planning on giving this, is it in yet? And the nurse would say, no, it's only, you know, the fluids are only 500 milliliters in. So it really was uh, a great step. And so I would encourage any of you to tr try to incorporate, you know, start small, start with one uh, into professional simulation and, and hopefully expand it out throughout the curriculum as you get uh, more sophisticated with it. Okay, well, I can see we don't have a lot of time, so I'll uh, is it all right if I move on? Sure. Um, okay. Do we have yeah. uh, another question? Uh, I, I believe uh, Jamie Kennel has a question. Just a quick oh, sure. comment, too. Yeah. Uh, we had a comment from Deborah, uh, and I'm sorry, Deborah, if I uh, butcher your last name, Deboche, um, that you know probably wouldn't use an AIDS scenario stereotypical of male gay relationships. I think that's really important, too. You know, when we sit around and, and design things, I think getting input and developing it in a multidisciplinary setting, in a multicultural setting, um, is really important so that we're not stereotyping as well. So I think that's been one of the, the traditional problems with um, the developing uh, simulation is we've got to take it through many layers of analysis and, and also even calling that out in the debriefings and in the preparation of the simulation, making sure that we're just not buying into uh, stereotypes uh, as these are developed and making sure everyone has the voice. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's very important that we have to differentiate 
generalizing because there truly are characteristics among any culture that can be generalized versus stereotyping. Yes. Um, so that's very important, and thank you for mentioning that. And Jamie, do you have a question as well? I do, just one other a quick question. Um, was there any, I, I think I know the answer to this, but that's always dangerous. Were there any of the studies that, that were included in this effort uh, that isolated the effectiveness as of SIM as a teaching modality for this topic, as opposed to other teaching modalities, such that we could argue and be more confident that SIM is a great way to teach cultural competency or cultural humility as opposed to students spending roughly the same amount of time getting uh, lectured to or, you know, arguably lectured at. So, yes, there were studies that had that type of format. Um, and when we looked at the word simulation, I, I included virtual simulation as well as mannequin based. And there were programs that demonstrated that virtual simulation um, resulted in better learning outcomes than the traditional means. So we do, we do have a lot of evidence to indicate simulation as a superior pedagogy. Excellent. Okay, so what do we do now? We, we know we have a problem. Um, we need to train simulation facilitators in cultural humility. As we mentioned, sometimes there might be uh, biases or stereotypes that are being represented and it's just because of a lack of training. Um, so that's pretty important. And often I think it is neglected from the traditional training curriculum for faculty. Faculty develop is, a, is another podcast. <laughs> um, I'd recommend that we interpret diversity in the broadest sense to even including individual diversity. Um, there's a big movement towards precision medicine right now, and that is recognizing everyone is individually and highly different. And so even though someone could be the same religion, the same background, the same um, racial makeup, um, there's a good chance there still may be major differences, <laughs> potentials for miscommunication, et cetera. So um, I would say make sure individuals understand diversity very broadly. Think about plotting out your SIM curriculum and making sure diversity is represented throughout. So if you have maybe 15 simulations in your curriculum, Try to integrate different diversity elements and plot that out so you can make sure that happens. Um, look at the standardized patients you're using, the mannequins. Uh, make sure diversity is represented there. Look at the signage, um, the SIM facilitators in your SIM curriculum and your SIM, uh, your SIM center. Make sure that diversity is represented. And then evaluate. So as I said, I have some work coming forward about trying to evaluate if a certain way of debriefing, et cetera, leads to increased um, cultural humility from the students. So, um, may I ask a question? Of course. Um, you talked about the fact that there were no standardized ways of evaluating the, um, uh, the ability of the simulation to uh, to create cultural humility or diverse or diversity uh, attention. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm, I may be anticipating this, but do you have you or are you in the process of developing tools to evaluate the effectiveness of what we're doing? Because this is one of the problems I've run across is not only not knowing how to do it, but how to evaluate whether I'm do what I'm doing is working. So I do have a tool and we were piloting it now. I should have some preliminary data um, on the reliability and validity of the tool um, very soon. Uh, the tool that I developed is, is um, to measure the, the phenomenon of cultural humility. Um, and so we have that measure coming, but until we can measure it, um, we're not sure exactly what are the best methods of teaching to ensure that the change really happens. So we're getting there. Um, you can certainly email me afterwards if you'd like to look at the tool or see the tool. Um, so we're, we're making a dent, a very small dent in the... <laughs> I love the question. Um, you know, I think one of the things you kind of snuck in there that, that was almost imperceptible with, with Jamie's question was 
there's lots of there's lots of evidence around you know that uh, simulation as a pedagogy is uh, very effective and more effective than than even lecture and that that hits a little little bell in my in my mantras and I think in the EMS world we're still learning about those studies we haven't we haven't really those studies aren't not are not in our consciousness and so we're I'm going to ask you to share some of those links as well not just because uh, I think Michelle's question may be even broader than not not just uh, cultural humility but also just the effectiveness of of the educational process am I right Michelle yes I'm, I'm, I'm not only looking for I'm looking for ways to teach it I'm looking for ways to test whether the teaching works I'm looking for uh, ways to improve to know that we're improving the outcomes in the long run and uh, that's one of the things that when my own research I have not been able to find is how I mean there are games to play there are uh, some interactive uh, methods of doing this but we don't have any way to evaluate their effectiveness because sometimes I'm not sure how clear the goals are the, these goals are unquestionably good ideas we want to teach cultural humility okay let's define a few terms and when we start talking and I like the, the your, your uh, diagram on the cultural humility what it means mm -hmm. but what it how do you turn that into an objective for a class and how do you then test whether that objective has been met because that's what it's going to come down to for educators isn't it I think uh, this is Megan too and I think uh, also we're after I mean ultimately translational research is translating it in to improve patient outcomes uh, reducing those disparities you know dropping that gap and then the same goes for student outcomes so um, you know reducing disparities in student outcomes which we're seeing come through in the educational literature so that's the, that's a translation but then in the short term we need that level one translation and that's what you're getting at I think which is what are the student learning outcomes just a comment that I, I went to a um, it was a conference on from the ACCJC, which was is a, uh, a accrediting commission for community and junior colleges out here on the West Coast, and uh, and it was there was a presentation by a nursing faculty and theater arts faculty, uh, and they wrote. Advanced Mac Cleaner has detected issues that need your immediate something attention. Something in the background here. Somebody's got something <laughs> in the background there if you can mute it. <laughs> um, but th there was a, a presentation from nursing and, and theater arts, and what they had presented was an interprofessional learning uh, outcomes that they had combined and submitted. And, and these are official documents. These are not just, you know, a lesson plan. This is the student learning outcomes. Are, go from the and let's say you're at a community college they go for, uh, through to the state chancellor's office and they're you know recorded as part of the the record the co official course outline of record so they had developed uh, interprofessional learning uh, student learning outcomes that that both theater arts and nursing uh, students were to achieve and those learning outcomes related to advocacy for patients and social justice so and, and they had measures for each of these learning outcomes in simulation that, you know, it, it would, you would have to develop these measures. And that's what I think groups like, and Sahaj had actually, he, um, I think his internet might have disappeared on him uh, from India, but I'd love to hear that what, what they're working on. Um, if anybody is from the, the committee, uh, the Cultural Competency Committee from the or task force from NAMC is on board, you know, just send, shoot us a message to be unmuted or type in your response yeah. to this. You know, Megan, what are they doing and working on to develop those outcome measures? I think Michelle's point is, is really good. And, and, mm -hmm. and I wonder, Michelle, if you've um, seen some of the work out of Rochester, New York, that um, has uh, patient satisfaction as a, as a marker for, for outcome. Uh, certainly, you know, if we measure, if, if we were to take Jamie's suggestions about um, in, in his research on, on pain disparities and administration of pain medication, that would be a, a, an outcome, a, an eventual outcome of, uh, you know, the, there's better care being provided if we had more diverse 
students in our paramedic classrooms, that's another measurable outcome that says mm -hmm. people are being felt you know, that the inclusiveness is, is improved. But in the immediacy of how, did my lesson work, did my objective work, I think that asking the simulated patient, and, and obviously this is difficult if we're using a mannequin, but if we're using a human, it's possible, especially humans that have a, a, a diverse side to them or, or, or print, uh, pretending to be a, a, a person of, of some diverse nature, not just ethnically, but also uh, culturally, and, and ask them if they felt treated with respect, if, because they're, they're obviously playing a role, but they're also um, taking it in. And that, there's a Rochester, New York study about patient satisfaction and, and that, that was used on real patients, but also in simulation. And it's in the ACGME toolbox for outcome-based measurements that, that really make, um, at least in medical schools, uh, g give a sense of, of empathy, particularly. So mm -hmm. was I treated with respect? Was, I, was Did they use my name correctly? Um, did I feel like I could trust the healthcare provider? These are validated instruments that have, have already been through some, some reliability, validity testing that then can be incorporated in, into an EMS simulation um, and, and give us some, some real data about those, those patients feeling at least treated differently. Does that make sense, Michelle? Yes, it does. And um, I'd love to look at that article. Um, if you can, you, I think you have yeah, my yeah. email. If you can send yeah. that to me, I would appreciate it. It's just that um, find sometimes, and I, I, I do believe everybody will understand this, finding the literature on this is kind of hard because it gets mixed up with a lot of other cultural things. Uh, I often find material for K-12 or, um, you know, religious organizations or something like that. Finding it for educators is harder than I thought it was going to be. And and that's a great point. I, I wonder if uh, Dr. Ferranda can tell us where the simulation research is getting published, um, because sometimes it's just a matter of finding the right journals and, and the right uh, search terms. And so maybe, you know, you've you've I alluded a couple of times to great international standards, for example, for simulation. And I, I wonder how many of our listeners actually know that there are international standards for simulation that may or may not apply to, to paramedicine. I, right. I, so, yeah. Um, Go ahead. I would invite you all to look at the, it's called INAXL website. If you go to www.inacsl.org, the International Nursing Association for Clinical Simulation and Learning, they have what they call the standards of best practice. And these are great. They show you exactly what you need to do to have effective SIMS from the design of the SIM to the outcomes, the debriefing you should use, um, how to evaluate. Um, so that is an excellent resource. All the standards are free. They're online, so just Google. Um, in Axel Standards of Best Practice. Another reference that comes to mind in terms of finding wonderful interprofessional instruments to look at teamwork, to evaluate different outcomes, is uh, the National Center for Interprofessional Practice and Education. And if you just Google Nexus, N-E-X-U-S, I-P-E.org, you'll get a host of free, valid, and reliable tools. Um, so there are a number of, uh, in terms of journals, there's clinical simulation and nursing, there's the Society for Simulation and Healthcare Journal. Um, we do certainly have a large body of evidence now showing that simulation is better than traditional methods. Um, and now we're moving more into evaluating simulation in a more robust way. And uh, I can't remember who said it earlier, but you're exactly right. If you can formulate an objective and you have a valid and reliable instrument to measure accomplishment of that objective, then you are operating at a very high level. Well, that's great. Um, I think it's also really that word integrate in your uh, recommendations, integrating diversity throughout the simulation curriculum, integrating throughout the curriculum is really important so that we don't make the mistake of just adding it on as a separate module. Well, today we're going to study, you know, we're going to talk about mm -hmm. Um, you know, cultural humility, and, and that's how we integrate it into our EMS program. We want to integrate it throughout the curriculum, and uh, I think that's uh, probably 
in my mind, the most important uh, of the Absolutely. recommendations. It's, so. it's a bit of the shameless plug for the Committee on Accreditation uh, Affective mm -hmm. Domain Evaluation that we're, we don't really Absolutely. just want to go, okay, well, right now we're going to actually look at your behavior. But in your other interactions, we don't really care that <laughs> you talk to a cardiac arrest fa family with a respectful and, and culturally appropriate response because yeah. we just really cared about identifying the rhythm and defibrillation. So it is, it has to be woven all the way through. So important. And I understand we have to wrap up. So I might just show um, or talk about really quickly um, a couple of tips. Yeah. Um, I'm coming up with a, um, a way of debriefing for cultural humility. So when you think about simulation and how do you actually do this, um, I've taken each of the uh, antecedents, the, the attributes, and the consequences from the concept analysis, and I've applied them to actual questions you might ask when you're debriefing. Um, so you might approach questions about power imbalance, like what power imbalances did you perceive? Uh, what types of diversity were present between provider and patient? Uh, when we look at the attributes, you might ask, again, this is just applying that, the concepts. Was the provider flexible? Were they rigid? If so, how? How do we flatten hierarchies? What could we have done differently? Did egos get in the way? How did the team function? So when you debrief using these questions, you might stimulate some critical thinking about cultural humility. Um, and last here we have the consequences. How did you empower the patient? Um, did you sense respect? Um, so, so this work is, is coming out. Um, and we also have some work on ground rules. And this applies in the classroom too. Just when you start your class talking about um, the ground rules that you have so that all are culturally humble. So you talk about entering each class with an open mind and you'll be aware of your personal beliefs and values. You'll focus on others' feelings as well as your own. You'll be flexible and humble. So ground rules might be another way of making this happen. Um, and so in terms of future research, um, I think we need to evaluate learning outcomes. We need to look at the presence of humility in simulation centers internationally and evaluate if debriefing is an effective intervention to achieve what we're looking for. Um, in terms of international standards, right now there's a couple words mentioning that when you design a simulation, you should keep in mind it's important to, to represent uh, race and culture, but that's really all that we have. So one of my pet projects is to try to push forward um, actually changing international standards to mention how important it is to truly represent diversity and humility, humility uh, in simulation practices. So when we think about policy change, we need to think about who are the accrediting bodies, um, who is developing the standards, and how can we get them to promote it? Because the odds are once they change the policy, then it'll trickle down and, and people will really start doing it. So in conclusion, Cultural humility needs to transcend the confines of the classroom and extend to the sim center so that we have improved learning, retention, and patient care. And I thank you for your time and welcome anyone to email me should they have questions or thoughts. Thank you so much. Um, we are uh, out of our, our time here and we want to just uh, offer a few, uh, any last comments from our panelists on. Dave, do you have any last comments? I, I love it. I put in the... Um... Uh, chat area and in the handout area for the webinar here if you're listening live. Uh, the Rochester uh, rating for uh, the, the, the scale for patient feedback and it was um, called the Rochester Experiment Teaching and Learning in Medicine and, and uh, it's a um, uh, I think a, a comprehensive assessment of, of professional competence. So um, uh, I'm happy if people want to email me, I can send them the form, but it, it actually also is a shameless plug for our sponsor, but it's inside FISDAP, that patient feedback form that's been, that's been vetted. And uh, I do want to just thank you for all the resources, um, Dr. Ferranda, that, that uh, these websites are fantastic and um, really spur on a concept of, of uh, doing more work for our world in, in EMS simulation uh, where, where we maybe are a bit in the Wild West and don't have as many 
uh, simulation resources and definitely don't have the 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 um, institutional support for doing uh, research that our, our our educators are mostly uh, doing primary education and don't have uh, release time or, or aren't in institutions that support their ability to to be able to do it. But we can assist people like you if we can work in with interprofessional, I guess, research efforts. And I would ask you to include us, uh, include the paramedics in your area, if not yes. nationally, in this process because they're doing simulation daily as they as they try and and do education. Well, thank so, you so much for having me and truly honored to share this work and hopefully, you know, one or I could provide one or two pearls to the listeners. That's great. We're going to continue to follow your work as well. So thank you so much for joining us. And thank you, thank you to everyone out there for joining us, and especially our uh, folks from um, all over the world, actually, which is uh, incredible. It's great to have such an international reach. And thank you to Mike Tagman and uh, Dr. Michelle Sweeney and Jamie Kennel for joining in on the panel. And please join us next month for this same educational research podcast. This will be after your those of you in the states who might be having Thanksgiving the day before. You'll be you know nice and rested and digesting. And join us for the podcast Friday, November twenty third, at ten a.m. Uh, well, that's ten a.m. my time, so it'll be ten uh, noon central, and. That will be Friday, November 23rd. If you want to present an upcoming article, you can email David Page at dpage at emsed.net. You can also let us know if you'd like to join us for a panel. So dpage at emsed.net. Just one reminder, too, we do continue to have the clinical podcast that goes on every uh, second Monday of the month. So in two weeks, you'll see us again on that podcast. All right. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you also.